Thank you. How's everyone doing? You braved the cold. Welcome. Our, um, two of our girls have been outside playing in the snow every single day and have been really sad that there isn't more of it. So they may be the reason <laughs> for the early winter. I apologize. Um, but if you could see their joy, it would take maybe some of the cold sting away. I'm going to pray, and then I do have something to share with you. So, Father, I just thank you this morning. Lord, I thank you for meeting with us in worship. That when we come before you, that you're not just a blank wall that we're throwing things at, Father, but that you actually are here with us. And I just thank you for that, and I thank you for the way that you've encountered hearts already today and for your faithfulness to us. And I just ask that you would continue to reveal yourself to people this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I love road trips. Our family has taken several. Um, all of my children do not feel the same way. Who here loves road trips? All right, good, a good number of you. All right, we can plan something. It's a good year to go. Um, but, you know, I have a couple of kids who like the trip part, like in terms of the destination. But if they could, they would fly to join us. Who here is one of those? Oh, wow. My husband is one of those. But I convince him that it will be fun because there is so much adventure. Like, you never know what's going to happen when you're taking a van through the mountains in snow. Like, what? Anything, right? Maybe you'll get there. Maybe you'll be stuck on the side of the road. But it'll be a great story either way, right? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to sway you all, even though you're already on my side. Not that there's sides. <laughs> but... <laughs> You know, just to sweeten it a little, because the next time I want to convince Jamie that we should go on a road trip, <laughs> I might need some reinforcement. So I love taking road trips. Some of my family are on board. Some of them we just drag along. Um, but we recently took one. It was two weeks. It was wonderful. And when we got home, I had this terrible thing where on my phone I have this app called Time Hop. Does anybody else have that app where you, you should get it because it will haunt your life. It's beautiful. Um, what it does is it shows you all of the pictures on your phone from that day in all the previous years. So the reason I say that it haunts me is because we took this amazing trip and I was so thankful. And then I came home and on my time hop were beautiful pictures of the sunny beaches in California, which is where we were a year ago. And, um, and then it was a little bit hard to settle in with the snow. In fact, yesterday I had this picture in my time hop, um, and it was of us at Sutter Mill. Um, it's in California. You can't tell, but we were like all sweating practically to death. Um, and if if we, you know, zoomed in on the people, that's actually why I chose one with just a couple of my younger kids, because they don't ever complain when I show pictures <laughs> of them. Um, but Sutter Mill, if you don't know, it is outside of Sacramento in California, and it is the site of where gold was discovered during the 49 gold rush, or what led to that. Now, before we went to Sutter Mill, I dragged my kids, because of course I am a good homeschooling mom, and I dragged them through the nearby fort um, so that they could see what life in that time period was like and experience it. And I mean, the sun was blazing and people were practically crying and gnashing their teeth. They just wanted to go get some ice cream. Um, but, you know, I, we persevered and we made it through the fort and then we went to the mill. And a couple of my kids, before we embarked on our trip, we had done a unit learning about the 49 Gold Rush and how much effort it took to get there and what they would do to try to get the gold out of the ground and all of that. And a couple of my younger kids, I think, had grand visions that we were going to find gold. 
But instead of finding gold, what we did is, there's one more picture. We threw some rocks in the river and called it good <laughs> and went and got ice cream in Sacramento. So what I want you to learn from this is that if it were up to my family to discover something through toil and like physical labor, we would not be looking so good, right? Because when the effort came and it was uncomfortable and hard, you know, a couple of them still wanted, because you can still kind of pan for gold, a couple of them still wanted to do that, and the rest of us were like, we're out. So <laughs> the reason that we didn't pursue, though, or we didn't stay is because we didn't think the outcome would be worth the effort, right? <laughs> I want to tell you one more story, and then I'll tell you why I am sharing these stories. One of our next road trips, possibly, I don't know, but we may go in a different direction. We tend to go out west, um, and we have a couple of different friends that live in Alabama that have been asking them to come visit us. And so we've talked about maybe trying to take a road trip down there. My older kids have begged us not to. You know, mom and dad, you can fly down and visit them. We'll stay here. It'll be fine. Um, but so we've kind of looked at what we might be able to do. Okay, when I say we, I have kind of looked at what we might be able to do if we were to take a road trip in that direction. And one of the things in Arkansas is a state park called Crater of Diamonds State Park. I first heard about this park through my brother-in-law before he took a trip. And this is a state park where they actually let you come and find gems, diamonds. You can hand sift for them. And the thing about it is that people often do. In fact, almost daily they have people who discover diamonds. They're normally around the size of a quarter of a carat. Um, but this past September, a man there made the biggest find that, or the second biggest find in the history of the park. And he found a diamond, I have a picture of it, that's a little over nine carats. Right, not bad. He's from Arkansas, he's been going to the park since he was young. Um, he was there with a couple friends and he said he almost didn't bring what he found in to the shop to see if it was anything because he didn't really think he found anything. But one of his friends that he was with was bringing her stuff in to have them look at it. And so he thought, well, I might as well. So he brought his in and discovered that he had an over nine carat diamond. Now, that's not a bad day, right? They won't tell you how much it's worth, you know, at the actual state park itself. But a similar diamond that was found that was cut down to four carats once it was, you know, finished was worth a million dollars. Uh, yeah. So are you all with me? Should we head to Arkansas? <laughs> so when my brother-in-law first told me about this park, I thought that'd be awesome, we should do it. And then pretty soon I was like, you know what, that just sounds like a lot of work. It sounds like Sutter's Mill. Let's just stay here and have ice cream, right? After I heard this story, I was kind of like, oh, maybe we should. Maybe we should do this trip where we can visit our friends and we can go find our riches. You know, there's 10 of us. We could all be panning. I could even give the two-year-old one, you know, like, <laughs> we're going to find something. But after a little bit, of course, it dies down. And my family isn't on the way to Arkansas right now. And the reason for that is because I don't actually believe that I'm going to find anything. In fact, when I hear stories like that, I don't know if it's because I'm too cynical or what, but I think it's probably less likely that I'm going to find a diamond like that because there's probably not very many of them, and that guy just took mine. <laughs> right? <laughs> is that just me? Am I the only cynical one? <laughs> but the point is, is that we are willing to put effort into something if we believe that the outcome is going to be worth it. If I really thought that my family was going to find a million dollars in a diamond, I would be there right now. I would have handed this service off to Dave. And I would be, you know, I would have convinced Jamie. He buys into my harebrained <laughs> schemes all the time, so I would have gotten him in the car. The kids wouldn't have had a choice, and there we would be getting our riches. In fact, maybe we'd bring you and we could pay off the building with what we find, right? Like, yeah, we can talk later and plan our trip. 
But the truth is that we're not going down there, at least not right now, because we don't really believe that we're going to go down and have our lives completely changed by what we find. Now I want to tell you a story from the Bible, and then I'll tie it all together, and it's found in Acts 17. This is a story about Paul. It's a famous account. It's him speaking on what was known as Mars Hill or Ares Hill in Athens. And the backstory to this is that Paul has been preaching in different places. And where he has been preaching, riots are breaking out. Um, because not everybody likes the message that he's sharing. So people are coming to know the Lord, but also chaos is following in his wake. And so he is brought to Athens. They leave him in Athens and they say, wait here. This is for your safety. Silas and Timothy will come and will get you in a bit. So he's waiting in this city, but because he's Paul, he doesn't wait quietly. The scripture tells us that as he's there, his spirit starts to burn within him because he sees all the idol worship that's happening. This is Athens, and they are worshiping many gods, and none of them are the true God, right? And so what he starts to do is he starts preaching. I think the Bible says he's having discussions, <laughs> but he's preaching in the synagogues and in the marketplace, and even though this is a culture that has many stories about many gods, what Paul is talking about, they can't comprehend. They've never heard a story about a God like the one that he is talking about. And so they come and they bring him to Mars Hill because that is where the leaders and philosophers of the day would gather together and they would talk about ideas and they would ask questions and they would have these discussions. So that's where I'm going to pick up reading. It's 17, starting in verse 19. It says, they took Paul and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know that this new teaching is what you are proclaiming, what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling and hearing something new. Must be nice, huh? They just stood around talking about ideas all day. <laughs> um, but they're just curious. Paul's not actually in big trouble here. They just really are trying to understand and they want to know. Um, so Paul, he stands up and he stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation and of, of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said. For we also are his children." Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the, the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead." All right, I know that was a lot, but I'm going to break it down. There's a specific part that I want us to look at today, and it's this, where Paul says, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far off. Okay, there are three things that I want you to walk away with today. 
And the first one is that God created you to seek him. God created all men to seek him. This is a journey. <laughs> it is something he is after the pursuit. He wants you not just to think that you've already discovered him through a religious system, but he actually wants you to seek him because that is what he created you for. Now, this is both more difficult and easier than you might think. It's, I'll tell you why it's easy down the road, but I'm going to explain why it's difficult. And that's because when God is saying that he wants you to seek him, that word there, seek, it actually has a lot of weight to it. In fact, I shared this in the first service, but when I was preparing my notes for this, for this morning, I wasn't sure that this was the message I wanted to share. And I really felt like the Lord was saying, nope, this, you know, this is what I've been walking through with him recently. But I wasn't sure that I wanted to share it because I'm still wrestling with it. <laughs> because I felt like I was doing an okay job of seeking the Lord. And then he comes to me and he says, I want you to seek me. And I'm thinking, but aren't I? <laughs> you know, and I'm realizing that he actually wants more. That he wants more than what I've been giving him. That it's time for me to go deeper. That it's time for me to fall more in love. That it's time for me to be willing to pay a higher price for my relationship with him that he actually wants to captivate my heart and he wants to be worthy of the pursuit of his heart. Like he wants me to seek him. Because this word here for seek is that you're seeking in order to find in such a way that you're demanding something from someone, that you crave something and you're going after it. It has an edge of desperation to it. You know, when you first... Um, enter into a romantic relationship, it is easy to pursue the person. At least it should be. If it's not easy at the beginning, it's probably not worth it. You know, but at the beginning, it should be that they've captured your eye and that you have that like tingly feeling when they come near you. You know, Jamie and I started dating when I was 17, which was just a couple years ago. <laughs> But I can still remember it, you know, and here was this boy who had been my friend for so long, but all of a sudden when I was with him, it felt different. You know, if his hand brushed against mine, there was something electric in it, right? Now, we've been married for over 20 years, and I still get that tingly feeling, but I want to tell you <laughs> that it's not all the time. When his hand brushes against mine, sometimes it's like, oh, move over, <laughs> you know? Why are you in my space, right? Because uh, that's what happens when you're with somebody for a long time. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret that it's really important in marriage to pursue the other person, even and especially when you don't feel like it. And if you're missing those tingly feelings, it may be that you're going to have to pursue them to get them back. So that's just like a side piece of advice there. <laughs> but, you know, a relationship with the Lord is so much like a marriage, but even more. And we sometimes, when we first encounter the Lord, when we first get to know him, there's this magical thing. You know, he's rescued us. He's taken us and he's forgiven us from our sin. He, he comes when we're not worthy of his love, and he gives us everything you know, and it's such an amazing thing, but as we walk with him day after day, it's easy to become like that old married couple so that we're no longer catching his eye across the room, but we're just coexisting. That's not what the Lord wants. He's asking us that we actually actively pursue his heart. This isn't a passive process. This is one that happens with hunger and desperation. You know, our family, along with road trips, we love the state fair. And by we, I mean I. 
and you know other people too but i'm not sure that all of our children share the same level of enthusiasm because there's 10 of us and we go with extended family too and so if you can imagine how long it takes to get down one strip of the state fair with like 15 at least people like you, like we're lucky to see a strip you know, because we're constantly having to stop to buy something, to bring someone to the bathroom, to like, just if you ever encounter us at the state fair, just go around us. Like, don't, don't try, right? But it's glorious and amazing and wonderful. And my mom goes crazy and gets the kids ride tickets and she gives them little envelopes with money so they can buy food. And it's like, it's an awesome experience. But one of the things that our kids look forward to there every year when they're young is the farm. Have you guys ever had the John Deere farm, right? And the kids go and they like pretend to be farmers and they do these different things and ride little pedal like tractors. And then at the end, they get to trade all their stuff in for a treat. Some of my kids, by the way, <laughs> pick the cans of corn, which I've <laughs> never understood, <laughs> but we always come home with at least one can of corn, so whatever. But they love this farm. And when my older kids were young, we were there with this big group, and Jamie, I don't know, I think was taking some of the kids to do something, and I was sitting um, with a baby like outside of the farm area, and then there were some other adults and our like some of our extended family and our kids going through the farm. So they are getting to the end of it and I look, they're coming out and my son is not with them. And I'm going, um, where's Josiah? And they just look at me confused as though they don't know who I'm talking about. And I'm like, Josiah, where is Josiah? And they say, oh, I don't know. We thought he came out to you. He had not come out to me. Now there is a panic in my heart as a mom who now doesn't know where their young son is at the state fair with wall-to-wall -wall people. Thankfully, he had gone out the farm exit and had been walking and realized he didn't know where he was and he couldn't find anybody, so he had stayed still. And so it didn't take me very long of looking before I found him. But that moment of desperation when I didn't know where my son was, that's something as a parent that you don't forget. And in the moment, I'm not distracted by anything else. I am singularly focused on seeking my son. I'm not gonna stop until I know where he is and that he's safe and that he's back with me. This is the type of seeking that the Lord wants from you. He wants you to seek him with that same focus, that same determination, that same edge of desperation. Lord, I need you. I want you. You are everything to me, and I am not going to stop until I find you, until I go deeper, until I encounter you more, until my heart <laughs> is connected to you in intimacy. Like, that is what it means to seek the Lord. In Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I think that's the key. Because can I just say that it's really easy to seek the Lord half-heartedly? You know, parents, have you ever asked your kids to find something? Hey, go get me, you know, such and such from the basement. And like 30 seconds later, they're like, I don't know, I couldn't find it, it's not there. You know, is that only me? <laughs> like, I'm sure your kids find it every time, the first time, right? In those moments, I become my mother, and all of a sudden, I'm like, if I go down there and find it, <laughs> you know? And I remember my mom saying that same thing to me, because they weren't exactly focused on finding whatever it was that I was looking for, or what I needed, because they don't need it, they don't care, <laughs> right? That is so easy. That's what it's like sometimes when we seek the Lord. You know, we, we check off our Christianity by coming to a church service. You know, it's such a blessing to have church services. It's such a blessing, all the resources that are available to us today. You can go online, and you can worship with amazing, like, 
you can have amazing encounter and you can have the top musicians and like music writers and you can you know listen to the most brilliant of speakers and you could do that for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours because we have so much information right at our fingertips and it's such a blessing but the thing is, is that if you're only hearing the Lord, what he's saying to other people, then you're actually missing something. Because the Lord wants you to connect with him personally. Like, I love events. I love, you know, the prophetic culture of today. You know, growing up in church, I didn't know a lot or understand a lot about the fact that the Lord's still speaking today or about prophecy and things like that. And I love that stuff. I love that we're a prophetic company of people even here, you know, and that people will give me prophetic words and will encourage me. And we have this culture that's so amazing. And I love it. But you know what I know about myself is that most of the time when I'm looking for a prophetic word, it's because I don't want to take the time and effort to actually go to the Lord myself and hear what he's saying. So I want Jamie to hear God's voice and then tell me what God's saying so that I don't have to actually pursue him to find out. You know, I have dreams a lot, and I, we have this ritual in the morning that Jamie loves. His eyes are barely open, <laughs> and I say, hey, can I tell you my dream? Okay, good. You know, and then I tell him my dream. What's it mean? And he always looks at me and says, well, have you asked the Lord? And the thing is, no, because that takes time. <laughs> Because I have to be patient, and I have to listen, and I have to go through a process, right? And I just want Jamie to tell me, well, this is what it means. Here you go, Nicole. This is what the Lord says. You know, and he is such a stinker that he does not do that for me. <laughs> but it's wonderful to hear the Lord's voice through other people. But that's supposed to be like the dessert. That's supposed to be the things that are added. Like the main portion of your relationship with the Lord is supposed to be a result of your pursuit of him. It's supposed to be you hearing his voice. It's supposed to be you getting to know him. It's supposed to be you becoming like him as you encounter him and he teaches you his ways. The Lord wants you to seek him and this isn't a passive process. When Jamie and I were early in our marriage. We were living in Mississippi at the time. He was in the military, um, and he had this Bible. You know, in the military, I haven't been in personally, but I've worked on bases. I've been around it for a while. And what I've realized is that you spend a lot of time waiting. If any of you have ever been in the military, you may be able to identify with that. But you have to be there on time. It's very important, and then you wait. Right? And you have to go to an appointment and you wait. So anyway, you spend a lot of time waiting and Jamie found a Bible that fit into the pocket of his BDUs. So he always had a Bible with him. And whenever he'd be waiting, he would just pull his Bible out and read it. Well, here we are. Um, actually, we were in North Carolina at this time, but we're going to a doctor's appointment. I'm coming for my job. He is, you know, coming from where he was on base. And so we're going to this prenatal appointment. It's kind of a big deal. I'm excited. And I get in there, and Jamie's sitting there reading the Bible. And I sit down next to him, and he keeps reading. And I'm like, um, excuse me. Like, I'm here. <laughs> you know, like, should your attention be on me now? And I get kind of irritated at him, and I don't remember our exact conversation. But basically, he tells me, well, why don't you read your Bible? And I'm like, well, I don't have it with. And he's like, well, I guess you should get a Bible. <laughs> and he keeps reading. <laughs> now, I will say that in future, you know, prenatal appointments, he did not do that. <laughs> but what I came to realize later is that I spent time jealous of the relationship that Jamie had with the Lord because he seemed to have such an intimate connection with him. The Lord would speak to him like Jamie's heart was on fire for Jesus. He was, you know, evangelizing. He was like, he would pray and things would happen. And it was just like amazing, right? And I'm jealous and I'm thinking, Lord, how come he's your favorite? You know, like, I don't get it. I follow you too. I, like, what's, what's going on here? You know, and, and I'm jealous. And then finally one day I realized, oh, like, Jamie's constantly seeking after the Lord. 
He is so hungry for him. Maybe that's why. Maybe if I had a Bible in my pocket and every moment that I had that I could turn my heart to the Lord, I was doing that, maybe I would be having more encounters with him too. The Lord wants us to seek him, and he wants it to be something that's not just passive, but that is actually an active pursuit of our heart. The second thing I want you to walk away with today is that the process of seeking the Lord is a journey, and it is a messy one. And I don't just mean that it might be messy. I mean that it is messy. So if you don't like messes, you're going to have to get over that. <laughs> In Acts 17, I want to look back at that again. It says, you know, that, that God made from uh, one man from every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, and yada, 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 <laughs> that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him. Now, this is a beautiful picture. I don't know how many of you have ever groped for anything, but this is a picture of trying to find something blindly as you're just feeling for it. Every other place in scripture that I found that word for grope is translated touch. You know, you're touching something. And so this is the picture of, you know, maybe it's nighttime and you're waking up and everything is really dark and you have to find something and you're groping to try to find the light. Or, you're, you know, you don't have your glasses on if you're me. <laughs> and so you can't see anything. You don't even know what time it is until you can grope and find your glasses and kind of get your bearings about you. Now, this is important. And the reason it's important is because <laughs> the process of groping for something is a messy one. You're not in control, and sometimes you look foolish. And when you seek God, I want you to know that you're going to look foolish sometimes that you don't actually know all the answers, that there is a process to getting to know him and to following him, and that sometimes I think our American Christianity actually gets in the way of this because we think that the pursuit of God is the pursuit of theology, and it's not. It's good to have good theology, but do you know that God has perfect theology, <laughs> and he gave it to us through Jesus, and I love the Bible. I read the Bible regularly, and it's given me so much life. I grew up in a Baptist church with great value for Bible stories. So I think everybody should read the Bible. But do you know that if you're reading the Bible absent from an encounter with the Lord, it's not really doing you anything? <laughs> because this is a messy journey. You're a real person, and God is a living God. And he is so much bigger than you know, and his ways are so much higher than yours. You know, we're such strange people. Maybe you're not, maybe it's your neighbors. But we're such strange people because we can be so insecure in one minute. So the Lord will be beckoning us towards him, and we don't want to go because we don't feel worthy. And so we do all these crazy things to try to work our way into righteousness, which is never going to happen. But then on the other hand, we're so arrogant that we think we know what the end story is, <laughs> that we think we know, so we don't go to the Lord just open to what he is going to lead us into. We think we already have the answers. I can't tell you all the times that the Lord has led me in a direction that I have never in a million years would I have gone. Like, I never would have chosen that. Lord, I don't understand. I must have misheard. You know, basically my whole life is the Lord patiently saying to me, I know you think you know what you're doing, but you're going the wrong way. <laughs> you're going the wrong way. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I have it all planned out. Lord, here's my plan. See, I do A first, then I go to B, and then C. You know, like it's going to be glorious. It's going to be wonderful. And he says, but you know what? I'm over here. And if you're going to seek me, then you need to come over here too because I'm not actually going to change my plan to match yours. Right? And so, so often I have egg on my face because I was so convinced that I knew. I was so convinced. And then I have to go, okay, Lord, I don't know. I'm just going to trust you. I don't understand. You're leading me in this direction, and it, I know that it can't possibly work out. But I'm going to trust you. 
What's amazing is that it always works out. And so often my plans don't. <laughs> right? <laughs> You'd think I would catch on a little quicker. But the Lord is patient. He is so kind. He wants us to seek him. And he wants us to be faithful in that journey and not to worry about looking foolish, not to worry about the things that we don't understand, not to worry about when things don't match up what we thought we knew. Because he's with us and he's guiding us. As we seek him, he can be trusted. He's going to lead us into life. Before I had kids, I didn't want to have any kids, maybe one someday. That was my plan. It didn't work out for me. And when the Lord first started speaking to me about following him in to motherhood, I thought it was the worst idea that I had ever heard in my life. I mean, honestly, it was a wrestling of my soul. And when I said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, I thought it was like, it was like I was a martyr. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous when I look back now, but it felt so terrifying to me and it was like okay lord i'm gonna follow you even though you're gonna kill me you know like i'm gonna follow you when i look at my eight kids now i am overwhelmed with gratitude because my life is so much better than what i could have ever planned for it to be it's so much richer and the lord has been so faithful to me and it has been messy like more messy than i care to admit to anyone I like things to be neat and orderly, but the Lord has had to time and time again rescue me and correct me and discipline me and show me gently and so lovingly that he can be trusted over and over and over again. Because when you seek the Lord, you don't have all the answers. And if you aren't discovering that God is different than you thought and that life with him is different than you thought it would be, then I think it might be because you're doing it wrong. Because God is bigger than you, and his ways are higher than yours. And so he is going to lead you into the unknown, but it's also going to be so much better than you could imagine. All right, my last point. So we're created to seek God. It's going to be a messy journey that requires groping in the darkness, but you're going to find him because he promises. It isn't like going to Arkansas to look for a diamond, where there's a chance you might find one. <laughs> it is a guarantee. And it isn't that you're going to find a nine-carat diamond either. You're going to find something worth so much more than that. You can't even begin to comprehend it. You know, if you seek him, you will find him because it's prom promised. In Proverbs 8, 17, it says, I love those who love me. And those who diligently seek me will find me. You know, God doesn't hide himself from us, but he hides himself for us. Our um, two-year-old has just discovered recently the game Hide and Seek. And she's a great person to play with. And the reason is because she will hide. Like, she, she gets the concept. But what she doesn't understand is that she's not supposed to lead people directly to where she is. So she will hide, and then she will go, Callie, Regan, whatever sister she's playing with, Callie, Regan, until they find her. So what's awesome is that they don't tell her not to do that, so they always win, right? So when they're playing with her and she hides, they don't even try to find her. They just stand there for a minute and listen for her voice. And then they go right over to her and they go, oh, I found you, you know, like a oh, big surprise. How did we find you again? <laughs> you know, and that's what the Lord does, though, is that he calls us to himself. Like we're not like we may not know what we're doing, but it's not because he's blind. It's because we are. <laughs> you know, he knows exactly where we are. He knows where he is. And he's calling to us the whole time and saying, this is the path. I'm right here. Find me. Follow me here. And it's such an amazing thing because we can bet everything on our life and going after the Lord because it's a sure bet, because it's worth whatever it costs, because what we find in the end is we find the Lord himself. It's amazing. We know this because he promises it, but also because he's the one who seeks us first. 
You know, it's amazing. There's a ton of scripture that talk about us seeking the Lord and seeking his kingdom. But what's amazing, even more amazing than that, is that there are also verses about the Lord seeking us. And he seeks us in the same way. You know, he is the good shepherd. He's the one who leaves the 99 to go after the one. He's the one who sent his son. And the son of man came to seek that which is lost. Like, he is the one who was willing to pay everything in order that we would be found. You're seeking somebody who <laughs> has been seeking you the whole time. It's impossible for you to seek after the Lord without him having actually first sought you out. You may not know this, but he has been seeking you out since before you were born because he's the one who created you. He knit you together. He sang over you. His voice has always been in your life. You just may not have recognized it yet. But because this is true, not only is this an overwhelming thought about the goodness of the Lord, but it means that he's safe to seek after, that you're not going to be spurned, that you can become foolish in his sight because it's actually going to lead into a more amazing relationship with him than you can even possibly imagine. I'm going to close with a story. While I was preparing the notes for this, you know, like I said, this is something the Lord's actually been talking to me about and I've been wrestling through. Um, so I'm preparing my notes and I'm sitting in our family room and there's, you know, mostly happy chaos happening all around me. I have my you know, my journal and like a notebook and a Bible and I have my iPad and I have these headphones on with worship music because I'm trying to pretend like I'm in a quiet, scenic place, right? Like it's just me and God. Go around the beach. It's good, right? And so I'm sitting like that and my two-year-old comes up to me, my little Ainsley, and she just starts climbing in my lap over my books she doesn't care that my iPad's in my lap. She's starting to sit on it, you know? And I'm saying, Ainsley, no. Like, you can't, I'm busy. Mommy's working. You know, you got to go go play. No, and she, she doesn't care. You know, she's not listening to me at all, <laughs> which may say something about my parenting, but we'll talk about that later, right? So she is not deterred at all by the fact that I'm busy. She just is determined to sit in my lap. And so she is sitting in my lap all over my stuff. I'm about to pick her up and put her on the floor and say, Ainsley, no, you know, like mommy's working. You can't do that right now. And there's this whisper in my heart of the Lord saying, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. Because, you know, God is always with us. He's in this room right now. Like, it's promised. He's never going to leave us or forsake us. But he doesn't want us to be content just being in the same room with him. He wants us to actually be determined to be with him. He doesn't want us to be put off thinking that we're, you know, that he's busy or that we're not welcome into his lap. <laughs> you know, like, there's so many examples of scripture of people who were so tenacious to go after the Lord that they broke God's rules himself in order to pursue him. And do you know what? They always found him. They always got what they wanted and then some. When I was young, that really ticked me off because I was, I was following the rules. You know, like I'm doing the things, I'm checking it off, Lord, and yet sometimes he still felt so far away from me. And now I'm reading stories and I don't understand. These people are not following the rules. Like they're messy. And yet, the Lord's choosing them. That doesn't make sense, you know? <laughs> but now I understand because their heart was after his. And that's what God's, God wants. He doesn't care about us following rules. I mean, don't go break all the rules right now. You know, but he's so much more concerned that we're actually hungry after him. He would rather have a David that's building a tabernacle that breaks all of the religious laws and customs, but is passionately worshiping and pursuing God, 
than someone who is just content with a religion instead of an actual relationship seeking after the living God. So today, your invitation, you're here, obviously you're seeking the Lord already, but he wants to go deeper. He's inviting you to follow him. The question is just if you're willing. If you guys will please stand, I'm going to pray. If we knew a nine carat diamond was waiting for us, we would all be in the car on the way to Arkansas. Well, maybe a few of us would fly. <laughs> right? But we'd be going down there. And we should be going down there. Because a million dollars can change a life, right? But it's nothing compared to encountering the living God. So I just want you to close your eyes right now. I'm going to pray and you can go to lunch. <laughs> but just take a moment right now and just allow the presence of the Lord to just fall afresh in your heart. Because while the Lord is after your pursuit of Him, He <laughs> has been chasing after you your whole life. He loves you so much. He knows you so intimately. He knows everything about you, even things that you're not willing to admit about yourself or that you haven't discovered about yourself yet. He sees it all, and he loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son to die so that you could not just seek him, but that you could find him and that you could be with him forever. So if you have never before encountered Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to do that right now. Whether you're in this room or you're watching this now or even later, Jesus, the creator of the universe, he's speaking your name and he's singing a song over your life and he is wooing you to himself. He is so good. And he is so faithful, and you can trust him. So if you haven't come to know him yet, I want to invite you to pray a prayer with me. And in fact, even if you already know him, I want to invite you to pray it with me too. So if you'll just repeat after me every voice, we just want to say thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to die on the cross. By faith, I receive his death as payment for my sins. Please forgive me and wash me. Please come into my life I surrender to you, Jesus. Be my Lord, my Savior, and my friend. If you just prayed that, today is an amazing day. <laughs> because the Lord's been seeking you, and the good thing is he doesn't stop seeking you even after you've come to know him. <laughs> he continues his pursuit forever. And life with him just gets richer and more adventurous and more filled with glory and goodness. So today is a really good day. If you have known the Lord a long time or if you're just coming to know him, today is the first step in a deeper relationship with him. And so, Father, right now, I just want to pray for each person and ask that you would give them grace and you would give them courage, that you would put in their hearts such a hunger and a tenacity to go after you, Father, that even if they've been sitting next to you this whole time, that they would not be content with that but that they would climb right over the books and sit right on the iPad and get as close to you as they possibly can. Lord, I just ask that you would give them boldness, that you would give them courage. Father, I thank you that you are not dismayed or put off by our ideas, 
but that instead you are just as tenaciously pursuing that we would become the people that you created us to be that you put people and situations into our life to woo us to you, to correct us, to bring us into the right place. So Father, this week, I pray that you would awaken our eyes, that we would be able to see you, that we would be able to hear your voice in new ways, Father, that we would have a stirring so deep within us as we go throughout our days that we couldn't help but be in constant communion and prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for each person here and for your great love. I just ask that you would bless them, that you would protect them, that your face would be upon them, Father. And Lord, lastly, we do pray for all of the names on this board and all the ones that are in our hearts, even if they're not written there, Father. We know that you are pursuing them that just as you laid your life down for us, that you laid your life down for them as well. And so, Lord, we pray that they would come to know you, that they would encounter the living God, Father, that they would encounter your love and that they would never be the same again. So we just thank you, Father, and we just pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful day. See you next week.